So I'll leave you with one last trend, which I've already this described, is which is our longevity. This is the progression we've made before health and medicine was an information technology, when it was uh, hit or miss, and it's now pushing 80. Uh, but this will go into high gear when we get to the mature phase of this biotechnology revolution where we can really reprogram biology away from disease and aging processes. According to my models, we'll be adding more than a year every year uh, to your remaining life expectancy in about 15 years. So you go forward a year, your life expectancy will move on away from you because of new ongoing developments. So if you can hang in there, we may get to see the remarkable century ahead. Thank you very much. cover a lot of territory <laughs> and lots of opportunity yeah. for uh, people to grapple with some a, of the subjects a lot of, you a lot of things will change. A lot of things have changed. So. You, by your own reckoning and by the evidence you've presented, uh, well, you certainly strike me as an optimist. The world is improving consistently. Um, do you think we really appreciate that? And, and if we don't, how is that holding us back? Well, let me first comment on the accusation that I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, I, I'm an entrepreneur, and I think you have to be an optimist to be an entrepreneur. If we knew all the problems we would encounter in a project, we'd never start anything. Mm. Also, being optimistic is, is more than an idle prediction about the future. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, if we're optimistic, we're more likely to have an optimistic outcome, and that's actually been demonstrated in scientific study after study with regard even to, say, the medical conditions. The people who are pessimistic about their outcome uh, do much worse than those who are optimistic. Um, that being said, I've written extensively about the downsides. I alluded to them briefly mm. before. Uh, take, for example, the downside of biotechnology. So we are working to reprogram uh, biology away from cancer and away from heart disease and from aging processes. Presumably good things, although not everybody agrees even with that, but uh, that same technology could be used by a bioterrorist uh, to reprogram a biological virus to be more deadly and more communicable and create a, a weapon. Uh, I was, I've been on the Army Science Advisory Group of the U.S. Army. In the United States, the Army is the agency responsible for protecting the public against bioterrorism. So 15 years ago, they were showing me around saying, well, here's our group that deals with anthrax, and here's our group that deals with smallpox. Would you like to see some samples? And I said, that's OK. <laughs> um, and they had 16 different groups like this. And I said, well, what are you doing about the idea of designing a whole new virus that suddenly comes out that you've never seen before? Uh, and that's feasible now, that it's just become feasible 15 years ago. Uh, they said, well, nobody's really talked about that. Uh, so I actually worked with them on a system that could respond quickly to new biological viruses. And we have a system in place now. It's not something we can say, okay, that's done, cross that off our list. Uh, by the time you create something, it's obsolete. Uh, but we can actually take some measure of optimism from how well we're doing against another pathogen, which is software viruses. Mm. If we sat back and said, well, no one would ever put out a destructive software virus, the internet wouldn't last very long, but we actually have put in place a technological immune system that's constantly scanning the internet, detecting a new virus, helping to reverse engineer it with some human engineering, quickly, within hours, responds and virally spreads some antiviral protection against the new virus. It's actually worked quite well. Nobody's taken down even a portion of the internet for a second over the last 10 years. Uh, that's a kind of a paradigm for how we need to deal with these kinds of dangers. Nonetheless, uh, there is a relinquishment movement. Uh, for example, Bill McKibben, who was the first to write about global warming, 
he's said actually to have discovered global warming, uh, went on to write a book uh, about these advanced technologies like biotech and nanotech and artificial intelligence. Uh, the name of the book is Enough, mm. uh, where he says, well, technology has been a good thing and penicillin saved millions of lives, but enough is enough and we should stop, the, we should relinquish these future technologies. And then goes on to spend a lot of his book basically repeating what I had written about the dangers of these technologies. Um, and a lot of the relinquishing movement uses my writings about these dangers. And I agree with that movement on the dangers, the existence of the dangers. I don't agree with the prescription. I think there's three things wrong with it. I think it's immoral uh, because there's still a lot of suffering in the world uh, which we have a moral imperative to address, particularly since we're really getting some real traction. I don't think we want to tell the cancer patients, well, we've got a lot of really promising things uh, that are going to hit in the next few years, but we're canceling all of that. Secondly, it would require a totalitarian system to uh, implement a ban against technology. That was the sort of moral of the, of the novel Brave New World. And thirdly, as in what happens in that novel, it wouldn't work. It would just drive these technologies underground where they'd be even more dangerous. Scientists wouldn't have access, access to the, the tools to, for example, create these technological immune systems. So when you get down in the details, it's a complicated issue, but at a high level, I think uh, we have an imperative to continue. I don't think we really could not continue. It would mean overturning the whole idea of progress, which goes back to the Protestant Reformation, which is deeply ingrained in our philosophy today. Uh, but we do need to be mindful of these dangers. I have a question from, uh, from Twitter, from one of our uh, attendees here. Will the exponential growth of information technology have a bearing on our ability to protect the ecosystem from population growth? Well, I began to address that at the very end. And, you know, if we were to stick to the same sort of resource uh, technologies we use today, which are based largely 19th century technologies, then the answer is any uh, movements such as uh, the use of these new med medical technologies that increase population uh, would create an immediate problem. But the same technologies that are going to uh, lead to longer lifespans are also going to lead to expanded resources. Uh, we are awash in water, excuse the pun, and we have new emerging technologies to clean it up. Dean Kamen's water machine, for example, cost a thousand dollars, conserve the water needs of a hundred people. We actually figured out it would only cost a few billion dollars to meet the entire unmet water need of Africa with that technology. I talked about solar energy. We have 10,000 times more energy than we need from the sun. That's just one example. Larry Page is very fond of going the other direction. You go down a mile or two, there's thousands of times more energy than we need in geothermal. Uh, so with these new technologies, we're going to actually untap very inexpensive environmentally clean uh, energy solutions. There are new food technologies emerging, which I began to discuss. Uh, there's a new book by my co-founder of Singularity University, Peter Diamandis, called Abundance, which in a book-length uh, treatise uh, addresses these issues in detail. Uh, but we, act we are entering actually in a an era of abundance, and we'll actually be able to live very well with a combination of the open source movement and the law of accelerating returns. Some would, argue, some would argue we already live in an era of abundance. Certainly more of the world enjoys abundance, as you, as you pointed out, than, than in any time past. But you also make the point that timing is everything with invention. So if we have greater capacity now than ever before to feed more of the hungry, why are so many still hungry? In other words, uh, you know, why isn't the world doing more to address um, uh, issues in, in a continent like Africa where We actually don't starving? have the answers quite yet. It'd be like asking, well, why, say in the year 2000, why doesn't everybody have the internet? Well, we just weren't at that point yet. It was spreading it exponentially. We're actually pretty close to that point now. 30% uh, of Africans have these mobile devices where they can access information, 50% of the farmers in China. The application of these to physical things like food and water is at an earlier stage. These technologies are on the horizon. 
Uh, they're working in experimental form. Uh, is, is they're it, not. It, they're not uh, mainstream yet. Uh, but it, I've, you go out 20 years, every physical thing will be uh, very ubiquitous and inexpensive. Is there a tipping point? Is there a, a tipping point of social consciousness that we become aware of a problem? and realize there is a technology available that with some investment will address that problem? Well, yes and no. You know, if, if you go back a few hundred years ago, no one had heard of the word progress or the word science. You, you probably heard all the names of the people who were doing science a few hundred years ago. Um, it was, people expected their grandchildren would live the same lives they did, and largely that was the case started to change around the year 1800 with the Industrial Revolution and has picked up speed ever since. Uh, today there's a uh, widespread appreciation of the idea of progress. When people hear about problems, they immediately think, well, how can we solve this? So immediately there's an assumption that there is a solution. But very often we see problems are not solved immediately, which leads people to be frustrated and think, oh, the world's getting worse. There's all these problems and they're not being solved. It's a good thing that we have better information about the problems, because we do get around to solving them. Uh, but there's also increased pain by being aware of these problems. We were blissfully ignorant of how the world lived hundreds of years ago, except to the extent that you experienced it yourself. And 99.9% uh, .9 of the world lived in dire poverty and extreme circumstances. We had, uh, as you know, there are many uh, uh, kids from high schools in our audience today who have been, I'm sure, inspired by uh, your comments. Uh, we had a number of questions dealing with education. So if in 50 years kids will carry computers a billion times more uh, uh, complicated, more powerful than what you have on your belt there, what should we teach in school? For that matter, will we need schools? Well, I, I have some strong ideas about education. Uh, which is the idea to bring entrepreneurship into the schools. That's why I like the commercial Susie's Lemonade Stand. My wife showed it to me, and now she regrets it because I went off and wrote a novel that's uh, <laughs> called Danielle, about a young girl who, starting at, at age eight and through her teenage years, uh, does the kind of things that Susie does in that, in that commercial, uh, making the point that a, young people can change the world and have the tools, and B, that's the best way to learn. If I think about h how I've learned and what, what little I remember today, it was from doing my own projects, where I had a passion and a vision of doing something, and along the way I would have to learn signal processing and linguistics and marketing, and, uh, and it wasn't, the, the goal was not, oh, I want to learn these things, the goal was to accomplish something. It doesn't have to be technological. Uh, I think learning by entrepreneurship is the way to learn, and not just as some after-school program where people might do an entrepreneurial project, but as the mainstay of education. Now, that's college students have the opportunity to do that. They have enough free time to start a Facebook or a Google or a Microsoft, particularly if they drop out of college. Um, <laughs> We don't give that freedom to kids in high school and junior high school. Uh, I'm not a fan of all the testing that takes place. In fact, you see its effects that schools start dropping uh, irrelevant subjects like music and art and uh, let alone a, an entrepreneurial program. That is really the best way to learn. And what we should be teaching kids, and this is the best way to learn it, is how to solve problems and how to solve them in the real world, and how to get along with work groups, and collaborate with peers, and reach out around the world and find other experts who can help them. Uh, I mean, now I hear from young people around the world, and if I can't help them myself, I'll try to connect them with, with other people who can. I, I mentor some young people, uh, a 17-year-old, for example, who's come up with a way to stop one of the major aging processes in our cells, and, She's already raised money to, to pursue that. I mean, uh, that, this is the right way to learn, to bring entrepreneurship into the schools, and not as a sideline, but as, as the mainstay of education. And yet, um, 
you have predicted that we're headed to a, to a not far distant future where information will be uploaded directly to the brain. So if we can do that, then what's the point of going to school? Well, uh, you know, the point of going to school used to be, gee, you need to learn, <clears throat> you know, who the queen was for this, uh, when there was this revolution and learn all these facts. Uh, that's now already irrelevant because we have, in fact, downloaded them. Okay, this is not inside my brain, but it may as well be. And we have uh, basically offloaded, uh, outsourced our memory, our personal memory, our historical memory to these technologies. Uh, and not just literally this device, but the whole cloud of computing that we use. Uh, I have work groups now that where a few people in a few months can do what used to require hundreds of people years to do. We have already made ourselves smarter by m integrating with these technologies. And the fact that it's not physically in my s side, my body is irrelevant. I mean, it is part of who we are. It's part of our civilization. Um, people say, oh, gee, if we can actually expand our brains and learn more quickly, we'll learn everything. That would be true only if the expansion of knowledge itself didn't stop. But in fact, the expansion of human knowledge goes even faster than our exponential growth in our ability to master it. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a few people doing science, and science was just one subject that one person could master, and there were people that did that uh, just a few hundred years ago. Now this thousands of fields of science and you know, experts in one field don't know nothing about a field that, you know, seemingly seems very similar, but is a little bit different. We have this uh, uh, explosion of knowledge. It's, uh, by some measures, doubling every year. Uh, and we're always up against the limit. No matter how much our knowledge is in a certain field, you go to the limit of it, we seem very ignorant. And our horizon of ignorance grows exponentially, because if you think of it as a sphere of knowledge, as our knowledge increases, the outer limit of it is increasing. So our, our knowledge of what we don't know increases exponentially. And it's always a struggle to create new knowledge. And by knowledge, I mean music and art and new insights into history, as well as science and so on. Well, I want to say I think you've expanded the, uh, the realms of knowledge in this room today. And certainly, I can hear the brains whizzing and whirring from here. Mine certainly is. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you and uh, a real pleasure hearing it. Great, Chris Walker.